if we keep going and going and going, right, if we keep tallying results, right, tallying up the total results like we are here, what's going to happen in the long run, right? Think about that. So you keep tossing and keep tossing and keep tossing, and you keep figuring out the total probability of H1. In the long run, the probability of H1 for the total, um, or for all experiments, well, I'll just say the total of all experiments, will get closer and closer to the classical probability. of 0.083. Let's actually see it for our particular problem. So we had four trials. So at the end of the first trial we had, it was 2 out of 20, which was 0 0.10. When we had the second trial, oh no, sorry, first trial was 1 out of 20, I'm so sorry. Second trial was 2 out of 20. I just went back to look at the page. All right, so this one was 2 out of 20. I'm going to write these down right now so I don't mess these up. Third trial was 0 out of 20. Fourth trial was 3 out of 20. Okay? So let me just show you what's going to happen. So the first trial, it's 0 0.05. Okay? Then let's accumulate for the next two. So that would be 3 out of 40. All right, what's 3 out of 40? I don't know, but I can find out. 3 divided by 40. Oh, look at that. It was 0 0.075. Then if I accumulate all three for the next one, then there's 3 out of 20, 40, 60. 3 out of 60 trials, 3 divided by 60 is 0 0.05 again. And then when I get to the total, the grand total, it was 6 out of 80, which is 0 0.075. And we keep going like that. Now, it won't hop back and forth between all these numbers. Um, that would be silly. <laughs> What's going to happen is that in the long run, the average is going to work out closer and closer right? The more trials we do, the closer it's going to get to 0 0.083. And as a matter of fact, I had an experiment or a, a simulation, excuse me, of precisely that. So I had a computer program simulate H1s in the long run. So you can see there are so many trials of H1 and so on and so on. So they did it over and over and over. Lots of coins and die tosses. And you can see 10,000 tosses were simulated. So 10,000 tosses. So the computer faked it, if you will, <laughs> for making 10,000 tosses. It would be very, very slow on this computer program. I actually did it with a different computer program because I couldn't stand sitting here and typing, you know, clicking on roll it and flip it 10,000 times. So I made a different program do it. But nevertheless, um, it it simulated 10,000 tosses of a coin and a die. Now, does this simulation support our answer? Well, look at what it's getting closer and closer to. You see that line? That's just below 0.01. It's 0.0083. So the answer is yes, right? And as a matter of fact, it settled down close to 0.083 after just a bit, right? After about the first thousand tosses or so, it's really settled in to 0.083. the overall probability is very, very close to 0 0.083 and remains there pretty much for the rest of the time because you have so many trials and so many um, cumulative results. So it, it just nudges just a little bit up and down, but it's very, very close to 0 0.083. Now think about what this means for gambling, 
before we leave this behind. Um, you started off with a winner, right? You started off here at one. So you got H1 right off the bat. But then you lost, and then you lost, and then you lost, and then you gained, and then you lost, and then, right? So what's happening is the chances of, if you were betting on H1, you would only win 8.3% of the time. And what the law of large numbers says, hey, if you repeat this experiment over and over and over and over, if you repeat this over and over, say like you stay at the casino for hours and hours and hours, then in the long run, that empirical probability will approach the classical probability. So these are empirical probabilities based off a of simulation, but they're empirical. And then in the long run, after you get to a certain point, it's all around 0 0.083. 0 0.083 is the probability in the long run. There is no such thing as the law of averages. You're not due to win no matter what. It, that's not how probability works. So there's a law of large numbers that says if you stay there, the probability of winning will approach the classical probability. But that doesn't mean you're definitely going to win at some point or definitely going to lose at some point. It doesn't work like that. Now, what does this mean for the gambling industry? We have one more comment to make before we leave behind, um, which is that casinos make money by keeping you there. Because they know that even if you get up, right, if even if you're ahead and you're winning, if you stay in the long run, you will lose. That's the point, right? Even if you're here at the beginning, it will, if they keep you there long enough, you will lose money. So what does that mean for you if you ever go into a casino, which I personally don't want to, but well, one thing is casinos have no windows. Go to a casino one time. Don't go with no money. That way you can't lose anything. They have no windows. They have no clocks. They have um, neon lights, which kind of help confuse your brain about what time it is. They have free drinks. Um, you're exempt from smoking laws. So you're always allowed to smoke in a casino because they don't want ha you to have to go outside and think of your life choices. So I just wrote all that down. Um, now, free food is a little, one that's a little bit weird. They usually have cheap food. I've known several people that have told me, oh, I just go to the casino because it's got a really nice steakhouse that's really cheap, right? They're pulling you in by having a good steakhouse, and they're hoping you'll stay there and gamble because gambling is how they make their money. Um, they have maze-like architecture. I've been in some of the casinos in Las Vegas, and you can't figure out where the heck you're going at certain points, right? They do it for a reason. They don't want you to leave. They want you to be brought in by the neon lights and the bells and the sounds, right? Bells, when anybody wins, there's lots of noise, etc. So, it's important to know how to gamble responsibly if you want to gamble in a casino. Not that I recommend it. I personally actually do not gamble in casinos. Because it's important for you to know how to do this responsibly in case you ever do want to go into a casino. I wrote up a whole bunch of different items for you. And there are more than just this, but these are the things I'm thinking of. You want to take cash you can afford to lose and always leave $20 in your car. My brother-in-law is a state trooper and he has found people on the side of the road that have literally gambled everything away and didn't have enough money for gas to get home. Never take your credit cards nor your debit cards to a casino with you. Um, you need to have your driver's license and that's about it. Um, go with friends and go with a schedule and a plan. You know, we're going to go see a show from 7 to 9, then we're going to have dinner and we're going to have, well, uh, one hour for gambling. Set yourself a time limit and then you stop if you are up and you stop when your time limit is up. Right? So up meaning you're, you're up ahead, you're winning, right? If you're up a certain amount of money, stop. If you're up, um, if you're done with your time, stop. And learn the games before you go. You do not want to learn the games of blackjack at the blackjack table. It would be a very expensive lesson for you. You want to learn them online before you ever set foot into a casino. Right? And I would recommend blackjack if you want to play a casino game because it's closer to fair than most casino games. We'll learn about that in Chapter 6. But again, I wouldn't recommend going at all because I do not gamble. <laughs> I prefer to save my money and use it for other things. But if you want to do that, again, make sure you're only taking money you can afford to lose.
and make sure you do it responsibly.